Welcome and please join me with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Bless America, land that I love, stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above, from the mountains to the prairies to the oceans, white with foam. Please. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so as we go through the invocation process, a lot of you know how it's done. Google rotary invocations and you start to clip and steal something from some club in Michigan 10 years ago. Uh, I can't do that with Joe McCool in this club, though. I, I have to uh, create a homegrown one every time. Uh, as I set out to do one uh, for today's invocation, I was thinking of the word service and all the different connotations that it has with us as Rotarians and all the different connotations as with people who aren't Rotarians. You can service your car and uh, provide service to others is, is how we look at it. Um, so I had a, a nice little invocation done for that and I went to get my coffee this morning at the Cumberland Farms and I saw a friend I hadn't seen in a while and I, uh, I said, hey Bob, sorry to hear about your, your mom. And he, uh, he, he Mom had just passed within the past month, and he said, uh, thanks very much. Uh, you know, it boggles me how much she meant to everybody else, and she was my mom, and she was always there for me, and I never thought she would not be. And that struck me for a minute, and I thought instead of talking about service, I think we should all just take a moment of gratitude, like everybody just to bow their heads for one moment, give a couple of moments of silence. Think about that one thing in your life that you don't know if you could ever live without. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Okay, let's silence our cell phone. Please continue with your lunch. I'm going to get things going, please. We've got a full agenda. Thank you to our greeter, Tim. Invocation, Eric. Sergeant Arms, Peter. Treasure was Tina. And Queen Sales was uh, Mary. Thank you so much. But once again, you know, your help is, we need your help. And thank you much for it. Any guest today? Guest, guest, guest. Brett. I am happy to introduce Jennifer Monsini. She works for EC Utopia. Utopia, thank you, over in Raynham. Uh, it's a technology company I'm not going to dare to say explain what they do. But Jen, uh, Jen and I went to Rock and High together and then at Syracuse together. So we've been friends forever. I'm happy to have her at the club today. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming. Any other guests? Rich. I'd like to introduce my very best friend, Uncle Murray Bensley from Source 4 on Belmont Street in New York. Believe it or not, we go to the same barber. Yeah. <laughs> so welcome, Murray. Welcome. Welcome. Any other guest? Guest? Any other guest? Right here. Elaine. Victor Silva from Surf Pro. Victor, welcome. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Joanne. We have the lovely Laura Streen. Is it Streen? Streis. Streis. I'm sorry. Laura Streis from the Charity Guild. She's the new executive director of the Charity Guild here in Brockton. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Any other guest? Guest, guest, guest. Visiting Rotarians. Okay, moving right on. Uh, this table is the birthday table, but our, our birthday, I don't know what happened to that. Someone, someone took it. 
So I can't find you for not being there, but whose birthday is today? Uh, is this month? Rich, who else? Rich is the only one that's being honest? That's all? Tina, okay. Anyone else? Betty. Betty, yes. Betty Ryder, who's not here with us today, yep. And that's it? Okay, well, let's... Brent? Brent, come on now. You'd be fining everybody for that now. Okay, so let's sing happy birthday, huh? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Rotarians. Happy birthday to you. Enjoy yourself. It's later than you think. Enjoy yourself while you're still in the pink. The years go by as quickly as a wink. Enjoy yourself, enjoy yourself, it's later than you think. All right. Okay, um, Betty's not here to uh, talk about any upcoming events. Uh, Tina, do you want to jump in at all? Anything to say? Or? Always, right? You always get something. Tina, Bill, yeah, great job, very good job. And remember our challenge now on those business cards, okay? Remember three at a minimum, okay? Remember that, please. Anything else anyone wants to bring to, to our attention that's going on? Uh, again, Betty usually takes care of that for us. Mr. Lutz. Well, just a couple of birthday boys that slipped under the radar. Oh, please let us know. The guy over here at this table, I think he might be legal drinking age now. Uh, Mr. Boyd Feinberg, February birthday. February birthday, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. And uh, over here, Peter Crone, Peter Crone, Peter Crone, February birthday. Is it February already? Yeah. <laughs> and, and over there, the, uh, the, the well painted gentleman in the back there, uh, Mr. Morgan, also. Oh, it's a February Lord. birthday. Yeah, he, he did. He, he did. He stood up, yeah. And um, uh, last, but certainly not least, past president, uh, Mr. Bob Tufts, who uh, there is a card going around. Please make sure. Yeah, please, yeah, yeah. kind yeah. enough to, to put that together. Uh, he's uh, uh, recovering at home, and um, so we wish him happy birthday and keep him in our thoughts. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Uh, I think the next thing I can think of is is the passing out of the carnations at uh, at the senior council center, which is February thirteenth. I believe we're doing that. Um, that's the next thing that I know that's coming up. So, um, and again, it takes an hour of our time. Uh, there was a few of us last year: Mary, Elaine, Betty, myself, Nick. There was a few of us, and and believe it or not, handing out those flowers to those seniors as they walk in for their luncheon. Um, it, it, it helps make their day. So, um, yes, Teresa. Where is that? It, at the uh, senior center, right across from the Y. Okay. Okay. Yes, right next to St. Patrick's. Yes. Yep. 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 Um, anything else? Anything else we need to? Um, we still have. Remember, at the end of this month, February twenty eighth, uh, we're doing community service, and remember that's going to be. Um, at Crescent Credit over in Commercial Street, up on the second floor, <coughs> and we'll be making uh, uh, bag lunches for a hundred of our, our city's homeless. So uh, 
we'll make sure we get emails out there. It's, it's in your newsletter. So um, please remember, uh, whether you go or not, just remember that uh, that's what will be on the 28th. On your tables, uh, Buzz, Buzz was kind enough to put printouts of the uh, portfolio performance here. So please take a look at that and see what a great job that, uh, that he's doing with, with Club's money. Is there any questions uh, for Buzz? We still have, you know, our speaker's not here yet. So if there's any, any questions uh, for Buzz or Buzz, is there anything that you'd like to uh, address us on? Okay, let's move. Oh, Chris, yes. Yeah, just on a couple people had a question on that. There haven't been any deposits, new deposits in there uh, in the last few years um, from the CNE. and I know we've raised funds for that. Those funds, from what I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, have been used for current obligations like scholarships and that type of thing, rather than pulling out of investments that we've already invested in. We've just used the current cash flow. Is yes. that correct? Is that correct? Right. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, sorry. Yes. Just to answer the question, I can share the question over. Yeah, that's what we generally try Thank to do. You. I think we may have had to tap into it once in the last couple just with some of the scholarships. I mean, there's a separate account that's a bank account. Yeah. Okay, right. that is, that's where the money goes in and out of on a current basis. Okay. You know, they don't touch what I'm managing. Right. Uh, but that is the goal is that we never, we just let we we have funds for the C&E fund. And so, right. We don't see any money going in. Rather than pulling get out of the car. Right. If we have excess, we can give it to us. But, but just so you understand, and the club knows it, at the board of directors, Tina reports on the balance of the business account and the balance of our CE C &E operating account. So it's it is uh, being used and monitored in the balance. Thank you. Uh, another thing. Uh, <coughs> St. Chris reminded me is, is our pins, the, the hundredth uh, year pins that we have. We still have a lot of them to sell. Uh, for those of you who haven't bought one yet, maybe you'd like to, uh, while we're still in our 100th year. Um, Chris and I have talked about uh, a letter, there's a few of us actually talked about a letter to get it out to some of our local politicians and what have you and, uh, and see if they'll, uh, they'll buy. So um, just a reminder that if you don't have one, please think about it, okay? Joe? Uh, speaking of pins, I wanted to remind everybody that the uh, pin drop series uh, uh, is uh, going to be put on uh, uh, as per schedule, uh, and, and the uh, Brockton Rotary is, is going to be uh, meeting at uh, uh, the Aeronaut Brewery in Somerville on uh, Sunday night, uh, uh, March 3rd. and. Uh, the Pin Drop Series is a series that is supported by Aeronaut Brewery and WB, uh, WGBH and WCRB, uh, the classical music station and the uh, public radio station in Boston. So it's well worth your while. And uh, <coughs> people are interested. I have had a handful of people sign up so far. Uh, see me after the meeting, uh, and we can sign you up. It's uh, twenty dollars. Uh, five of which will go to Brockton Rotary, and we have a discounted uh, price. Uh, the series is usually twenty dollars for a ticket, and it's uh, going to be uh, fifteen for us. Can Thank you, Joe. Arrange for carpooling. Uh, yes, Chris. Uh, uh, this is asking a question about carpooling. Do you? Right. So we're talking about taking an Uber from here. Yeah. Meeting here Sunday afternoon. Are you going to arrange oh. that? Yeah, I think I'm going to sign that. Yeah, why don't we see how... Okay. 
how many we have going, and then we'll make those arrangements. We still have a few weeks yet, so, but yes, yes. Okay, uh, let's move right into happy bucks, please. Anyone happy? Mr. Callahan. I'm very happy my daughter Rita is, uh, came home from China on Monday, and she'll be home for a little bit, but uh, great to see her and love her. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Who else is happy? Amy's happy. I have two happy bucks. The first one is because I slid in here really quickly uh, because my sister asked me to take her to Waltham to a doctor's appointment because she couldn't drive. She had something done with her eye yesterday. So I took her, dropped her off in Easton, and came here, and I still made it before the, uh, the scheduled guest, which I was excited to see, Brian Shackle. And the second do dollar is because the, um, the person who was getting the symphony people to come to our pancake breakfast to play music confirmed this morning that he has a big group coming to play music on the stage during our pancake breakfast. Thank you, Amy. Who else is happy? Buzz. I'm happy uh, because uh, the numbers are so good. And two is I have a, a new client transferring in who's bringing $8 million with them. Wow. Congratulations. $8 million is going in again? <laughs> Down payment. Thank you, Buzz. Mary. I don't have $8 million, but I do have three uh, happy bucks. First, I'm happy because SSA came out on um, Tuesday and helped with taking some ribbons and re off the graves. I gave out a late notice to people, but man, I've never saw someone sweat so much in my whole life. It was amazing, but we made a good dent on getting those wreaths and um, and ribbons off so we can plan for next year. That's my first happy buck. My second happy buck is my daughter got a promotion um, under one year of being at a job, 47, Fran. Um, and my third happy buck is my son-in-law leaves Saturday. I'm caught us like a sad, but he leaves Saturday for spring training. And so I'll be coming down to spring training to go visit him. So those are my three. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> Who else is happy? Tina. I have two happy bucks. Um, First is for my daughter. Um, she's been struggling this year. She's a junior, and she's in a whole bunch of AP classes. And um, got her to log on to get a report card. She has a 4.1 GPA, and she's on made honors. And her lowest grade was an A minus. So, uh, I was very happy. She's been lots of tears and long nights, and very upset about. And I'm just like, I don't know what to do. So, and the other one is. Um, this weekend is um, my kids' first competition, my twirlers, and um, I have uh, seven brand new from age three to 12 little kids who will be competing. Um, they're very, very excited, so um, hopefully I can make it through the day. <laughs> so, but um, wish them good luck. Thank you, Tina. Buzz. Uh, one more thing. Uh, you gave $8 million. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy because Alex chose a great necklace for her. Very nice. Good. <laughs> Mary. <laughs> All right, I have two happy bucks. One is for Amy's cat. I'm hoping your cat's happy. <laughs> is he happy? Yeah. He liked it? Oh, that's true. <laughs> he liked it. That's good. Okay, and my other happy buck is for, um, I officiated my niece's wedding this past weekend, and it was really, really special. And I, so it's, it just amazes me how all of us individually can do things we never thought we could do before. So it was a great turnout, and I was just proud of myself and the moment. Thank you, Mary. Who else is happy? Amy. I have one happy buck for last week because I forgot that I was happy last week. <laughs> um, and this one is for my three students who went and played at Carnegie Hall, and uh, and I should have been very happy about that. So uh, they having a great time thinking about the next competition, and uh, it's a great thing for everybody. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> who else is happy? Peter. I understand, yes, yeah. But uh, I have to announce uh, here that I'm retiring 
from hockey at 76 years old. No. Uh, Tommy and I went to school class at 61 in Brockton High. So here's my dollar. My surgeon told me not to play hockey. Well, I said, if you do and you get hurt, you're going to the rest home. <laughs> so that, uh, that's about it for me. I'm going to hang it up. I might take up some of the hobby, like uh, sled hockey. Or such, but I had a grand ride. We went to China once. We went to Russia in 93 and 2013. And Moscow and Sochi had a wonderful time. I love people around the world. And uh, I guess that's the sad part. I'm certainly going to miss it. It's my last call. <laughs> Thank you, Peter, for your last call. And good luck for retirement, huh? Anyone else happy? Elaine. I'm always happy when I collect pin fines. Of course. <laughs> I have um, $8 in pin fines. And just as a reminder, I am now selling pins. So anybody that comes into a meeting that doesn't have a pin, I'd be more than happy to sell you one. <laughs> Thanks, Elaine. Tom. Yeah, we're all you don't have to take from, uh, Mr. Putin, he was glad that uh, Peter left. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. Eric, were you happy? Yes, you yeah, are. I got a few here. All uh, right. Uh, happy buck for uh, our champion Patriots uh, in the six Super Bowls. Yes. Uh, that was a uh, fun ride and very unexpected. A lot of us longtime fans were saying, oh, this might be the end of the ride, uh, but it's glad we got another one in. Uh, also, uh, along. Um, Peter, it's a happy buck for you to be, I know from playing basketball every week that even at my young age, uh, it, it takes a toll on you. And uh, last happy buck is uh, uh, my son Gunnar, uh, he, he has his ups and downs. Uh, he goes to the Emmanuel School and he had an absolutely <coughs> terrible December, which is not uncommon for him. Kids get very anxious about Christmas and everything. And uh, But this year it, it extended into January and uh, we went in there, we had a meeting. He was getting so wrapped up in whether or not he was going to get caught up with his classwork and all that. And uh, we, we had a, a nice sit down with him. We said, fresh start February. So far, every day in February, he's come home. I had a good day at school, Dad. I had a good day at school, Dad. And that makes me happier than anything. Good. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Okay, I'm going to end it. You know, the theme seems to be the children. So I've got my three boys. Uh, my oldest is Jason, my middle guy is Mark, my youngest is Sean, and they're all doing very well. And I just thank Our God speaker, for Mr. Shackman, is here. Um, yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. So let me just quickly, uh, just a little bit about Brian. He's been with NECN and NBC10 Boston since 2014, but he's actually been with NBC Family since 2002, when he left ESPN to become a sports anchor band reporter at NBC Connecticut. During his time in Connecticut, as well as CNBC, MSNBC, and NECN slash NBC 10 Boston, Brian has covered a range of stories, most notably while at CNBC. He covered the financial crisis, the oil boom in North Carolina, uh, North Dakota, and several major hurricanes, including Sandy. In sports, he's been to the Super Bowl, Kentucky Derby, World Series, World Cups, and Olympics. He most proud of his documentary work, which has involved uh, the, the tobacco industry, exotic animal trade, UPS, uh, FedEx, and Yukon legend, Geno Oriema? Geno. Geno Oriema. Brian has a bachelor's degree from Amherst College and a master's in English literature from Clark University. He lives in Branchwood with his wife and three children. Let's have a warm welcome, Brian Shackman. I, I will probably eschew the microphone as long as everyone can hear me. I'd rather just have a conversation. And I, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions about my career path and my day and my life. And I, you guys can ask me anything, anything you want. By the way, is, is anyone here from McGovern Honda? Because I think I'm going there after. To, Maybe fire cars. <laughs> um, I'll finance it. <laughs> okay, we might have to talk. Used to, used to I um, it's funny. I literally came off the new newscast and and took some baby wipes from my face and drove straight down here. So, and I, you know, it's funny because I'm 47 years old, and I'm in a con we're in a constant state of analysis about news, right? I mean, and I think we we all are, and it's even exacerbated my world. And I'm so far away from what I started off doing, and 
I, there's two real things I want to talk about today, and, and then I want to leave it up to some questions. And I'm happy to talk about anything you want, but the current state of affairs is so interesting from a news perspective. And the first thing I, I want to say, uh, you know, Brockton has its challenges and has its great things going on too, but the one thing Brockton's lucky to have, believe it or not, whether you like it or not, is a newspaper. And I've done a lot of work. I started off at the Worcester Telegram and Gazette. That's okay. where I started my journalistic career. And, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with people about, about local papers and local media. And historically, what local papers do is they are a check and balance on the local government and the local businesses and the local culture. And what's happened is, is that as all these newspapers have gone away, and there's been some efforts to replace it, whether it's Patch or whatever, but those are just more informationally driven. They're not socially or community or culturally driven, right? And, and as those papers have left and nothing's come in its place, we've lost a check and balance in our communities. And so, you know, and starting off in local news, I just, I don't know what the future looks like in that and what's, if anything's going to come in its place because it doesn't make any money. Because ultimately, the news business is still about making money. I don't know if people saw the New York Times yesterday, you know, the failing New York Times, its digital business is, is bigger than ever. They just hired a couple hundred new journalists and, and they figured it out and, and, and they're going to be fine. Whereas we thought they were probably in an existential crisis just a few years ago. So I, we, in the newsroom, at home with my wife, who's very socially conscious, we talk about that. Like, what's going to fill the void in our communities from an information perspective? Because nobody does local, like local, local, right? We'll come to Brockton for a fire or a shooting or a drug something, but we won't cover it on a regular basis. And, and I think it's something that's really a void in our communities, and I don't know what's going to happen there. I'd love to say that something will, where there's a, you know, a, 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 a demand for it, but I just, if it's not financially viable, who's going who's gonna to do it? And w which leads me to this interesting thing, and, and, and I'm going to be all over the place because I'm, I'm a little tired. I went from pond hockey tournaments and Lake Winnipesaukee <laughs> straight into the Super Bowl, into the bean pot, to like this week, so I'm a little, I'm dragging a little bit. Um, but it, it's about news, and it's gone past fake news, right? I mean, I don't know if you guys have been following how now there's this whole culture of sort of getting people to get sucked into actual things that are produced to be fake. So if, if I tweet something out that's fake and that somebody can expose it, and then, or it's not what it seems, there's all these traps now in the media for information. And I used to view, you know, when I started off at ESPN uh, in 1998, my job was to, they used to have, a, they used to have what we call clubhouses. Each team in professional sports had a page, and they had to populate the page before they automated it, and they had to populate the page with content. And I knew, I was 26 at the time, I was a late bloomer in terms of t trying to be a journalist, and I really wanted to get ahead, so I was like, I'm going to be the best clubhouse editor ever, and which didn't count for a whole lot. But what happened in 1998 was, I learned about the internet, and at about between the hours of 3.30 and 5.30 every morning, every major newspaper in the country pushed out their content to their websites. And nobody really realized it, so I got up really early and I just went to, I covered the NHL at the time, I went to every single city and just plucked articles and put them on their pages, and what I found is that no one, it, it was literally the best place, best aggregator of hockey information in the world, because I got up at 3.30 in the morning and no one else knew what was happening. Um, and now it's, that's not how it works. I mean, not only are we on a 24-hour news cycle, we have access to everything, and things are being pushed out all the time. They don't press publish at 3.30 in the morning to, to let out the day's thing, because they, they didn't want to cannibalize their own newspaper, right? So they, they wanted to make sure the content was pushed out online at the same time the papers were hitting the coffee shops, and that, that just doesn't make sense anymore. And I, and I mentioned it because what I was doing in 98 now is, is useless because everything's, A, the pages don't have editors anymore because it's all automated. And also we, we get information on stuff in real time, basically. And what we're struggling with, and I am professionally apolitical. I am not anti-Trump, I'm not pro-Trump. Uh, I have a major problem with the general culture, because if you're, if you're on the left, you can't say anything constructive about what goes on in DC, but if you're on the right, you can't criticize the president. So we're in this 
situation where my 47 years we are, there's not as much in here as everything's here. And so the terms fake news and deep state, those things are interesting concepts for me. But now it's just I, in the newsroom, and I, as a person, it's hard to know what's true and what's real. And so I think that what we've learned, because there's a good argument for a lot of different things, and so through the last two years, I, I don't take anything at face value. And it's hard to find the real truth of things, especially because I'm now an indoor cat sitting at a desk and not out there in the world reporting on it. You know, I, I think of this Virginia story, how many are familiar with what's going on with this mess in Virginia, right? So the, the governor is in a pickle, the lieutenant governor is in a pickle, and now the attorney general is in a pickle. And guess what political party the number four guy in the state is He's from? Republican. He's a Republican. So now the Democrats are saying, oh, oh we can't have them all resign because we can't have a Republican governor. And so that there's a, obviously a moral double standard going on because if any of those three had R's on their, on their identification, they, their clamor would be incredibly strong to get them out. And they all three probably need to go. Uh, and, and so, but now the, the subtext is, is that the number four guy's a Republican and he could very well be governor and that swings the state. And, and so that kind of coloring of things, you know, until this morning, I didn't really think about it in that context. And then yesterday, I'm like, well, it's interesting the timing on the lieutenant governor's news because, you know, he's an African American and he's the number two, and maybe they were sitting on that for a long time, which they were. It came out earlier. And then the woman comes out today and identifies herself. And I just say to myself, okay, well, the headlines from two days ago now are completely different from what I know now. And I have a tough time knowing what's true at any given moment. And I, I don't know what it's like for you guys, and I, I literally read the news all day long. And my approach for the last, probably since I went to CNBC in 2007 is, and I wish I could have done this as a student is, is that when I get put on a story, I don't ever want to have to cram. So if I study a little bit all the time, I never have to cram for anything. So like, and that's why Twitter, I truly love Twitter because it allows me to be informed to what degree I want, where I want all the time. So then if I have a subject comes up, if you ask me a question, something about you know, the stock market after this, I'm, I'm not like, well, I gotta check on that. So it allows me to sort of have such a broad base of knowledge. But I, I will tell you that in the newsroom, we struggle all the time with what to choose to do and what not to do based on we don't know exactly the real truth. And it seems like we know less about it now than before, even though we have more access to information all over the place. And so, and these are conversations we're having all the time. And, you know, people ask me all the time, I, I, I'm trying to, and this is the last thing I'll say, and I'll, I'll open it up for questions, because I, my job is so different than when I started. I mean, I read the news. I mean, I, I, I love, this is what I consider a core part of my job. I mean, people who know me, I'm on the board at School on Wheels. Um, and I do a lot of work for uh, a cancer nonprofit in Braintree because I think that's, that's part of what we do. And we see less of that from our journalists every day. But I mean, now I, I just read the news. That's all I do, right? And, and, and I'm not an active part of the process. And I pitched a show uh, for New England Cable News. Don't tell anybody outside the room, okay? Because it's a good <laughs> idea. <laughs> and I don't, think, I don't know where we're going to do it because it's going to cost some money. We don't have a lot of money. But I, I, my idea was to take me off this. I do 7 to 10 a.m. on NECN, and then it goes till noon, but the last two hours are on TV. And then we do the noon on NBC10 Boston. And I want to get out of this, and I want to, to my wife's chagrin, I want to embed myself in New Hampshire until next February and just do, a, uh, I found a radio partner in New Hampshire, do a, like a morning Joe-ish kind of radio TV show and just get all of the candidates, pundits, and journalists that course through New Hampshire leading up to the primary. I just feel like, for, I've said this now eight times in my life, but this could be the most important election of our life, and it's in our backyard. And, and I'd be stunned if they don't do it. And I, I will literally drive to Concord three or four days a week and just try to get the candidates and all the news and information. I think that we get tons of unique content. And, um, and they might not do it. I'm willing to 
changed my schedule, put my family in a difficult spot. I have kids between the ages of nine and 12, because I feel like it's important. And I feel like I have to get out of the house, if you will. And um, it's tough when someone says, well, we can't spend money on that because X, Y, and Z, or we need you at 7 a.m. in the morning to do X, Y, and Z. And so I made the decision that if I'm gonna stay in this business, which I might not do, if I'm gonna stay here, I need to get out, I need to get out of, because I mean, I can sit in my studio and try to get the information right, ask all the right questions to producers, I ha have them do everything, but I mean, literally, I can't, I can't, I'm not touching any of it directly. It's all indirect. And I have a lot of journalistic standards that I exercise every day, but it's not the same when you're not out there trying to figure out what the truth is. And I'm not some, you know, Edward R. Morrow type. I mean, I, I'm not, that's not me. I'm just saying that I've reached the point where I understand what I'm doing is cushy, but it's not satisfying me with what's going on in our culture of news, right? I'd like to be able to say, well, I talked to Biden the other day and he said this right to my face. You know, I think it's time for me to get off the sidelines and get a little bit more in the mix. So I, I have tons of ideas on, on a lot of different things, but I, I don't want um, to bore you. So whether it's specific stories, how we cover this area, my life, my career, or whatever, I'm happy to talk about anything you want. And if you want to ask, be anything political too, you can feel free. Um, a lot of times in these situations, people want to let me know how they feel. And I'm okay with that too. <laughs> I'm okay with that too. I can really. Um, so, kind of touching on the fake news aspect of, of listening, watching the news. So, we know Fox News is biased one way, CNN is biased the other way, and maybe they have an agenda that's being pushed out for them. How do you, uh, who are you accountable to when you tell a story? And I mean, do you feel like you get pressure from the higher ups to, to push a certain story, whether it's Democratic yeah. or Republican? It's a really good question. I, you know, um, and it's, it's, it's interesting because it's changed my viewing habits too, because I really, between CNN and MSNBC and Fox, I have to watch all three because, you know, CNN made a calculated decision because they, they wanted to survive. You know, they, it was a, it's financially ratings driven decision. It's proven that if you are uh, opposing what's currently in power, more people gravitate to it. And they made that decision, and both MSNBC and Senate, CNN are doing great because of that. But it's unwatchable, even if you, to me, even if you're a progressive, MSNBC can be unwatchable because every hour is the same. That's my problem with Fox News and MSNBC. It's all the same every hour. Now, for me, I will tell you two things. One is I'm 47, and you know, I, the first election I remember was probably Reagan in 80, and I have 26-year-old kids writing my scripts, and even if they're really bright, they have no sense of context, and they have no sense of what lang the powerful language they use, so every day almost, I have to take out another snafu by the president, or one more hateful remark by so-and-so. That should not come out of my mouth, right. ever. And not everyone I work with um, catches that or changes that or what have you, but there is no, from a local news perspective, and this is the, I have a lot of problems with what we do, but I am never, there's never, a, there's no culture of like, you need to put it this way or do it this way. I just have to go against the natural sort of unconscious urges of others. You know, for instance, our managing editor is a really good friend of mine and he's really liberal. And sometimes I push back because he makes choice coverage choices that I think are a little bit tainted by his bias, right? And you know, I, I sometimes we have heated conversations about it. But for me, like we truly are supposed to be neutral. It's impossible to be totally neutral. Now, if I had a talk show and people sitting next to me and I'm asking questions of a, a pundit or a political scientist, that's a little more challenging because. It's, it's, it's harder to mask where you want to go with it or what you want to do. But in terms of presenting the news uh, and having you know, conversations about it, I do my best to, to play it down the middle. And it's not easy, mainly because a lot of people around me who provide the content for me, uh, they don't even know that they're putting out their own biases. But it's a, it's a really good question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, notice the modern trend is for straight news people, not the opinion side of things, but straight to to report on something, I guess, because it's breaking fast, and, and to talk and say, well, if this is true, this is, and it's usually about the president, you know, damaging, damning, whatever, <coughs> instead of what I think the old standard was, let's prove this first before we come out and say 
you know, let's let's do the background journalism to figure out if it's real or not. And now it's just, well, we'll just speculate. If this is true, this will be the worst thing ever. Let's talk about it for the next four hours. Yeah. Well, they have to feed the beast, right? And I, you know, it, and you know how many times in conversations we've had, like, this is the one that's going to bring the president down. <laughs> and you know, I mean, it's been like literally like two thousand times people have said something like that. And I also remind people, uh, let's be honest, Susan Rice came out and said some pretty dishonest things you know, after Benghazi, so it's on both sides. I, I feel like that goes back to my former point, like we don't know. Like, I don't know when, um, when President Trump says it's a witch hunt and then you know, we have Robert Mueller's indictments and then you know, all the stuff was, well, on one side they're just, they're getting indicted for lying and not for necessarily doing something wrong, right? They're just, they lied to the people that asked them questions, and then you ask, well, why did they lie if they don't have a reason to lie? And I think that's just about feeding, feeding the beast. Um, and they need this, we have basically three 24-hour news stations nationally, and, and they have to have something to talk about. And so they, they give that caveat at the beginning of the conversation, and then they go. Do I think it's the greatest and the, the right thing to do? No, but I mean, we don't know. We literally don't know what's going on. We don't know what Robert Mueller knows. We don't know what the truth is about President Trump. We don't know if he's 400 million in debt to the Russians or if, if Putin has something incriminating on him. We have no idea the communications when he's one-on-one -on -one with no interpreter or no note-taker. We just don't know. And so I, I don't have a really good answer to that. I just know that they, they, they have to feed the beast. And right now, this is. The Trump White House and the Trump presidency is, is basically 80% 80, 80 of news on a national level every day. We'll be there in the so when you are trying to get a story, so, so are the stories being brought to you directly or is it content that you're creating? So locally, locally and nationally. Like nationally, we're, we're sort of at the mercy of what the national, whether we're, it's our daily hit with CNBC or our Washington reporter who does it for all the affiliates, we're sort of at the mercy of what they want to give us. Locally, you know, we, there's an editorial meeting at 8 in the morning, <coughs> noon, 3, and 7 to go over what stories we want to cover and what reporters are on what, and then the producers choose what they want to have in their newscast, what reporters they want to have in it. The producers are the first line of like, you know, there's usually maybe 30% of the newscast where they can fill it with whatever they want. And for me, usually I come in, I look at what they call a rundown, which is the layer of the whole show. I express myself. Like, I have a pet peeve about, like, I, I don't like fires. If a fire, we covered New England on New England Cable News. If a fire in Brockton, and nobody's hurt, but we have good video of the flames, and it, that's our first story, I think that's bullshit. You know what I mean? I think it's terrible. You know, I want something that impacts the most people and the people care about, not if it's good video for our open, right? And so we have those conversations. So locally, we have more control about what to cover. The one thing I will say also about newspapers, we still get a lot of good content from the newspaper. And it gives us ideas to go out and, do, and, and to go do things. Because even though newspapers are pretty much gutted, say we have 15 full-time reporters or 18, they still have, the Globe still has 100. You know, so they're still in, places that we can't get to, and we still take a, take a lot from them. It's not quite what it once was, but we still take a lot. So uh, we have the conversations, and you know, the, sometimes the 7 a.m. and the 9 a.m. run down are similar. If there's something I, we didn't like or I didn't like, we'll have a conversation. We'll take something out and put something back in. Like today, the Dow, you know, there's a report that President Xi wasn't going to meet with uh, Trump before the deadline for the tariffs to jump up, and the Dow went down 350. And I'm like, we got to put this in. Usually we have a feed to the big board, which we got to show it. And producers sometimes are resistant because they don't want to change anything because it needs more work. And then we have that conversation. And then sometimes if they don't work it in, I'll be a jerk and do it on camera just to make sure people know. <laughs> um, but I mean, to me, like, I, you know, it's. So did you show it today? Uh, they didn't have the feed. <laughs> but I mentioned it, you know. And so I, I think, you know, and, and I'm not here. I, I, I have great relationships with my producers and people I work with, but I'm not here to make friends. I'm here to do my job, and I take, I still take journalism very seriously. So, but we we don't produce and, and create all of our stories that are on newscast. Yeah. Oh, did, he was uh, he was next, and then and then you and then. Uh, thank you. First of all, Brian, thank you very much. You're one of our more compelling guest speakers, and I appreciate not only that you come down to visit the club, Thanks. but also that you uh, put your money where your mouth is in terms of your service to organizations like School on Wheels. Appreciate that very much. 
My question had to do with, um, you mentioned that uh, you love Twitter as a, a sort of a baseline feed yeah. uh, for, for your knowledge. And then you also mentioned how those stories break and they have to feed the beast. And uh, it, it uh, brings to mind a recent story about the uh, Kentucky uh, high school kids that were at the March for Life on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial and all the different ways that that story broke. And one of the things that we found is uh, that behind the scenes, there were organizations uh, capturing different feeds and perspectives and feeding that out to support their narratives. Um, right when you clip the video of the kid, like they didn't show us what happened before, yeah. they just picked it up when he was standing right there. Yeah, exactly. So how do you see that uh, moving forward and uh, in, in, in sort of reconciling that with uh, what you described as sort of the old-fashioned journalism where people are actually out uh, with, you know, with the touch and piecing a story together like, uh, the, you know, the, like the Globe Spotlight story comes to mind. Yeah. That's, you know, just cultivated over months and years even of, of uh, shoe leather and, and research and, and investigation. Right. And then a story like this breaks and it's all of a sudden chopped into a million pieces. And right. Stuff. Well, the, you know, it's a big question. The, the first level is we, we don't have the luxury of, of spotlights runway. But we actually have a, uh, a we, we launched an investigative team when we launched NBC 10 Boston. And they've done a really nice job. They did this this thing just the other night on, you know, I'm going to tell this quickly, about oil mitigation or whatever, and like this woman turns out her house is a hazardous waste thing, and she has to spend like $50,000 cleaning up, but the two homeowners before her had a spill, never put, never reported, and her insurance won't cover it. So they sold the house, and it's not their problem, it's her problem. And our, our investigators did the story, and hopefully it'll change the law so these people can get insurance or maybe there's more responsibility when you sell a house or, or what have you. On the local level, my point is we can sort of get to the bottom of those stories. The story on a national level, we're only beholden to what's out there and we, we can grab. And what I can tell you is that we, can, we, we don't put something out there right away, right? So I mean, you know, in terms of Twitter habits, for instance, like whether it's the, um, the, the fight at the Patriots parade that everyone saw, or you know any of a number of stories, you have to go across all the spectrums to see if there's other video. Like you can't just say, oh that well that is stunning. Okay, well but I have to check every single source that I know on Twitter to see if there's other cell phone video, other angles, other on the video. And that one I, I learned pretty early on that you know when everyone picked it up, and it's bad. It's bad the the CNNs and MSNBCs for clipping it where they did. I mean it, that that was problem in the story. So we have control over that locally. Nationally, you know, we're only, we can decide not to, not to do the story or have a caveat, but we, if we don't, we can't go, we're not going to research that story. We're not going to send somebody to D.C. or to Kentucky. So um, we have to make those editorial decisions from, from, from a distance. And we just try to, to vet out all the sources. You know, we, we don't, we don't put like, Unverified. NB we are beholden to NBC to stand. So, two sources to confirm. NBC has to give the go ahead to do the video. We can't just say, "Oh, that's great video. Let's put it out there." We're not allowed, we're not allowed to do that. Sorry, what? Oh, sorry. what happens when uh, you have to have your story and you are covering a story? Let's just take, for instance, the State of the Union mm -hmm. address, and information is given out that is wrong. Is it the newscasters? Is it the newscaster that has to bring that out? So information in the speech? Yes. So for the Trump speech, there are actually people at NBC now that and, and a lot that they we have people who are specifically tasked with ta fact checking right. the speech. Um, that's done at NBC News, and so uh, they do that right right away. And that's pushed out to everybody. So we don't have to have anybody in house. Because again, our job is to report on the news event, not to parse it from that kind of critical perspective. That's just not that's not our, our role in the whole system. Um, but NBC News has people who who literally a team of people who fact check it, and then they push it out to all the affiliates and to MSNBC and NBC News about what what is contested. But that's another thing about this whole world. It's like if someone says 2,000 2, people caravan coming here, and then somebody oh no 2,000 criminals have crossed the border, and then NBC says six. I just didn't see the sources on any of those things. 
So I mean, just because MSNBC or other sources say only six people, and it's not 2,000, and most of the people who, who came in illegally did it through ports of entry or whatever, but is that I still don't know the source of those pieces of information. So I'm skeptical even about our own until someone says in the 2016 report that you see here, then I know. I mean, people just throw around these numbers willy-nilly, but there is a system in place to fact check. Now, with us, it's just about, I have 90 seconds to spend on the State of the Union. We just have to pick the two most important sound bites we think for you, and then go from there. That's all I can do, uh, is the two most important topics coming out of the speech. You know, one thing I, I learned today, P President Trump didn't mention education once in his 90-minute speech. This is the third or fourth longest State of the Union in the history of the country, and not one mention of, ed of education. Um, do you, I believe, are next in the end? Yeah, I just uh, a couple of comments. I, I would agree 100% about that local newspaper thing. Uh, I still get the Enterprise delivered seven days, and I was out. I was out of it for about a month because so I hadn't paid my bill. <laughs> <laughs> and I called him up, and he said, "Well, you're like 60 days in arrears." I said, "Okay." Well, I sent you a check. But without that, and I, I would agree with you. Just the local news, uh, things that happen in our Chamber of Commerce. I'm not talking about the break-ins and all that stuff. I'm talking about news articles, that, whether it's in business, in my town of Bridgewater, things that happen that I might not know about, but by having that newspaper and reading it you know, every night, it doesn't take long, but it certainly is, uh, helps you kind of stay abreast of it. Secondly, your comment about this New, New Hampshire primary, I think is critically important. I mean, there's five people in now, there'll probably be another on the Democratic side. What are we gonna have, 10 or 12 or 15? How are we going to know ab about these individuals unless there's someone like you or some reliable source telling us about the lady in California or Ohio? You know, we just don't, you don't get that kind of... Uh... Yeah, I think it's important. It's important, and I also, you know, I think the question, like my favorite question, I've thought about this so much, you know, I want to get into policy, but my first question I feel like is always going to be, well, what are you going to do in a one-on-one -on -one debate when Trump calls you little or a liar or a speak or whatever? Like, are you going to stay on policy, or are you going to try to engage him on the, on his level? And, you know, because I think that if Trump runs again, and, and that's not a cer certainty, that if he runs again, um, he has a proven track record of really belittling people to the point where they're, in that, you know, that, it's a one with their, to their, gives them a level of impotence. It's, I mean, Jeb Bush, by all accounts, a good guy, a very capable guy, he made him look like he was the most insecure person in America, yeah. and he did it very quickly. Yeah. Um, so but there I, might be, there might even be a race on that side. Who knows? Yeah, well, uh, there's a rumor that uh, this guy like Kasich in Ohio, if the Mueller report's really damning, that some people want to jump in a primary. I, ultimately, I think that that would take a lot of courage and it would blow up the Republican Party. So yeah. I, I, I find that hard sell, but you just you don't know what's what's going to happen. But it would be fun to be up there and to be in the middle of it to try to have those conversations. And I don't think anyone else is going to do it quite like that. So. It would be really fun if there's a radio station in New Hampshire where the, they, they do like the pints and politics all the time and they're willing to give us three hours of their airtime locally in New Hampshire too. So we just got to come up with the money somehow. Um, go ahead, then I'll do something in the back. So you, you kind of alluded to the uh, merger between Comcast and, and NBC and how that all worked and how it worked in the Boston marketplace. And what have you seen as kind of pros and cons to that? Is there more economies of scale? Is there more news sources, more random resources? or has there been kind of a dwindling of the staff? And, and well, I think the launch, you know, we're about to, I don't know how many millions it costs, but we're gonna move into a brand new media center that's gonna have Telemundo Boston, NBC Boston, NECN, and NBC Sports Boston all in the same building in need of. And so they obviously feel like they can make money, because the one thing about Comcast for GE, GE sort of loved having the bling bling of TV, and they, we, I mean, we could do whatever we wanted. And Comcast, they, you need to make money, <laughs> you know, and so they're very, very uh, focused on making sure you make money. Personally, I think it, it's counterintuitive. We have a shrinking industry, right? Fewer and fewer people are watching television, especially local news, and then we added a station to a market. So you're, you got another fighter battling out for a shrinking piece of a pie. So I think that and people have habits. I mean, you remember when um, BZ switched to, what was it, like CBS Boston or whatever? Remember that? And it was, yeah. a disa it was a disaster. And so NBC Boston has not gotten traction yet. I mean, 
There's just not a lot of people watching. And so coming off of Sunday Night Football, we'll have a great day. But generally speaking, the ratings are not good. And so I think that what they need to do is they need to distinguish the biggest mistake that NBC Boston made, and maybe you should stop tape, um, <laughs> <laughs> is they didn't, they didn't do something totally different. They just launched and they did the same thing everybody else does. And we're trying to figure out, well, if we do something different, what does that look like? Because I, I, I have my own ideas, but I think that if you want, you, if you want to survive when the millennials aren't even watching you, um, what are you going to do to stand out and get people to stay interested? And I still think there's a huge, there's a value in local news. I just think there are what, like six, five or six stations that do it full time. I think there should be three. We, I mean, it'd be great if we went back to the old four, five, and seven. You know what I mean? Because the market doesn't need five full time news stations. So who's going to be there in the end? I think because we have Comcast, hopefully, we'll be there because we have a, such a big, you know, we have a company that owns DC, NBC. It owns New York, NBC. You know, it owns Hartford NBC, and so leveraging that regional dominance hopefully will be able to survive. Quick follow up? Yeah. So, um, on a lighter note, I, so, you know, I'm in a suit and tie every day, so I look at the newscast and see what they wear, and kind of, you know, You're a fashion guy. Yeah, you want to know what's going on. <laughs> so, I look at your shoes and you're wearing cordovan with a yeah. blue suit, right? So, That's the way I was always taught, right? Now I see all these young guys wearing brown shoes with brown belt. So, I, you know, it's funny, <laughs> and I was pretty, exactly. so on NECN, I'm supposed to go no tie. I brought three ties in today, and I was a blue one, this one, and like a gray and blue stripe, and I asked uh, one of my coworkers what I should wear, and I, she told me to wear this one, and I forgot that I have these color shoes, and with the orange, it totally doesn't work, but um, <laughs> I, lost my, I lost my train of thought. Um, <laughs> Okay. Wait, brown shoes and belt. Well, I, well, no, this reminds me. Like when I decided to go into journalism, my one of my first internships, I was 26 years old in grad school, and I worked at this uh, internship in New York at a magazine, and I had to report to a 22-year-old assistant editor, and uh, and it's this punky kid who just got out of the University of Michigan, and I, I didn't know anything. Like I had black shoes and a brown belt, and he's like, "Dude, you're embarrassing yourself." <laughs> what are you talking about? He's like, you have to have the same colored belt as your shoes you see in And I was like mortified. I mean, I was so embarrassed. And so now, I because I wear black shoes mainly, right? And, and it's easy with the black belt. But I have the, this colored belt. And I always, when I'm done, I stuff it in the shoe in my closet so I don't forget. And the same thing with my brown shoes. I stuff the brown belt in the brown shoes so I don't forget. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of fashion, it's all sort of personal preference. Like, I like, this is sort of like my craziest suit, actually. I just like sort of streamlined, sharp, you know, blue tie with a crisp white shirt or whatever. So, I mean, I, I don't like no tie. We don't do tie on NACN, and I don't, li I don't like it. Plus, ties, if you're a man, like, to me, if there's no tie and you're like this, that doesn't feel as good as this, especially if you've put on a few dad, dad bought LBs. So, um, you know, I, don't, I miss the tie, uh, that's for sure. Did you have a question? I just wanted to. Great follow-up, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> totally awesome. Those are the hard-hitting questions we need. <laughs> I was saying that the, the, the question about fashion came from the male gender. <laughs> but anyway, I, you mentioned very briefly in passing that you use 90 seconds. It's a 90 second like for spot some really State of the Union? for every news. Is that for like every news story? No, some, some it's 20 seconds. I mean, listen, yeah. there's a lot of theories about news and local news. Some people believe in high story count. They call it high story count. We want to get as many stories in as we can. Yeah. So if you go longer, that's just weighing you down. Personally, I hate that. I, I hate the, OK, here's the headline. Now we're on the next headline. Now we're on the, I'm like, well, wait a minute. Tell me about, you know, and, and is there a trend? I know that the pendulum swings, and you know, the trends are bad too quickly.